to another one of our live, live, life, live lives. And we are going to kind of experience through history what other people have done as far as food and that kind of thing. And, and we also want to introduce a cookbook that Cindy Hoffart Watson got together, which is a, a quarantine cookbook, will, which Leah will tell you later. So Leah is, is a brand new librarian. She just graduated and she's a children's assistant right now, and she has done some research for us. So welcome, Leah. Thank you. All right, so um, what I have, this is all fairly new to me. I am not an expert gardener or um, an expert Expert remember to, record, remember like to record, just remind you. Sorry. Yes, I have. I started recording as soon as you introduced me, so we're okay. good to go. All right, so let me just share my screen. And... All right, can everybody see the screen? Okay, all right. So I'm going to introduce the cook. Cooped up cookbook, food love in the time of in the time of quarantine, which is completely new to everybody here. <laughs> All right, so this cookbook was was compiled by Cindy. Cindy put all of these recipes together, um, and the most of the recipes, actually all of the recipes, are sent in from uh, various library staff members. Some of them have been used in past life programs. I uh, send you which ones. So if you're interested in knowing exactly which ones have been used in past life programs um, in some of the cooking programs, uh, just let us know and we can try to find out exactly which ones. Um, but this book is dedicated to Claire um, for her 17 years of service at Lone Star College Library. Everybody, come on. yay, Claire. All right. And I'm going to show more of the cookbook a little bit later, but for now, oops, frozen. Here we go. All right. Um, this is just a sneak peek of what's in the cookbook. Um, the table of contents just kind of lists everything that we have in there. Um, appetizers and side dishes, beverages. It's organized just like your regular cookbook, soups and salad, main dishes, slow cooker dishes. And we have quite a few because as you can see, it's like 66 pages. And here right below is the link to where it is on the life program. And at the end of our program, I'll kind of show you how to navigate to get there. Um, it's on the life page and you just go to um, our regular loop guides page, events and programs, and then you click on adult and then you find the life programs. And it's, it's right there at the beginning. So fairly easy to find. And I'll show more of the cookbook at the end. All right, so today I'm going to cover just a little bit of history about food in hard times um, and focusing mostly on victory gardens. Um, we saw that these are uh, gardens that popped up mostly in World War I and World War II and then other difficult times throughout history. So here we go. All right, so during times of uncertainty, we have a tendency to try to gain some sort of security by preparing as best we can. Here in Houston, if a hurricane heads our way, what do we do? We stock up on food, water, always the toilet paper. Um, and then, of course, we get gas, too. I don't know if anybody else walked into the grocery store at the beginning of quarantine and uh, saw some bare shelves. Um, I always get a little paranoid when I don't see food and because I'm a, a little paranoid about going hungry. Don't know why, because I've never really gone hungry before, but it's just kind of a fear. And I think it's a fear that most people have. So when COVID hit, I went to the store and tried to stock up a bit on food so I wouldn't have to get out later just to be on the safe side and saw all the empty shelves. And it's, it kind of makes everybody it perpetuates the feeling of, oh, I better get this now. So then the shelves are even emptier because it might not be there later. Um, so we kind of have a tendency to grab. But um, this isn't the first time in history we've had some food shortages or kinks in the supply chain. 
Um, as I mentioned before, both world wars put major strains on the food supply, as well as other natural disasters. And a lot of the agriculture has changed over the past 100 years. Most people don't farm anymore. Um, less than 2% of the U.S. population is involved in farming as an occupation. So that's a lot less farmers out there to supply food. Um, having your own food supply during hard times can kind of give you a sense of security. And in the case of the World Wars, uh, food was presented, creating, growing your own food was presented as your patriotic duty. So let's go a little bit. So World War I actually introduced Victory Gardens officially. Um, the war garden movement actually started in World War I. Uh, sometimes they were called war gardens and sometimes they were called victory gardens. Uh, the government encouraged people to start their own gardens to help with supply shortages because the US and Canada had to feed most of the European nations that were besieged by fighting. Most, because they were, the, a lot of the farms were actually now battlefields. So they, not only could the farmers not farm on them, I mean, they were all messed up. So there was no way that they could grow the food that they needed to supply that country. So the allies would have to help support one another. And the US and Canada, of course, did not have battles fought on their soil, so it kind of fell to them to provide most of the crops for the, uh, the European nations and uh, all of the troops. And uh, most of the commercial crops grown in the US and Canada were sent overseas. So that meant most of the food was going over there and people needed to kind of supply their own food over here in the US and then, of course, in Canada. Um, the US, Charles Lanthrop Pack organized the National War Garden Commission in, the Mar in March of 1977. Mm -hmm. And they really promoted people using any vacant land they could to plant their gardens. They were heavily promoted through posters and pamphlets were provided for amateur gardeners because a lot of people at this point had also moved into the city um, with the Industrial Revolution and all that kind of stuff. So there was less farmers already starting at this point. Um, and the posters and propaganda were all over the place. So it wasn't necessarily just in the U.S. that um, they were encouraging these war gardens. Um, I mean, Canada and the U.S. were were big on it, but it, they also promoted it elsewhere in the other countries. Like here, I found a bunch of posters and pictures through the Library of Congress, and that's where you'll find most of these pictures came from. Uh, there are tons of different posters. I just still selected a few that kind of captured the feeling, and uh, some of them kind of target the different types of people we might see during this time. Uh, and not all of them are about victory gardens, but they all deal with food and people kind of doing their part to um, help the war effort, basically. So this one is from time, World War One, and this one is from France. And it actually says, let's grow a victory garden. That's what the translation said it was. Um, and it was actually designed by some school children. So it was from a whole group of posters that they um, tried to get children to design and then distributed them. So they were really reaching out to all ages. It wasn't just adults that they were trying. They really, really reached all ages, um, trying to promote um, growing your own food and conserving and helping the war effort. Here is another one. This is uh, one from Canada. <laughs> Uh, 1914 to 1918, uh, again, showing um, a little boy <laughs> saying, let's go garden. Um, and it kind of just shows the who they were aiming at quite a bit, families, um, making sure that everybody's doing their part. And I found this one kind of interesting. Um, it kind of targets uh, the families and makes it a little bit more personal 
because as you can, if you're looking at the poster, you can see in the background, they're, they're thinking of their father who's off fighting the war saying, remember, we must be daddy too. Um, encouraging them to be careful about what they eat and make sure that they are doing their part in saving food. Um, it just, I don't know, I think it makes it a little bit more personal. So they're really good at their advertising campaigns, I think. Um, this one I found kind of interesting. I don't know if um, going to the grocery stores during uh, COVID <laughs> over the past few months, I saw a couple of people that were, you know, looked like they were just gathering all they could of one particular item um, and basically, you know, having it, it looked like they were hoarding. Don't know if they were buying for other people, but it kind of looked like that. But here you can see that that was highly discouraged during this time. Um, if you look at it, there uh, it looks like there was actually a fines if you hoarded food in Canada. Uh, you can see the police officer in the background, and the two people are a little worried they're going to get caught. And up on the, you can see the flyer posted next to the window, and it actually tells you the fines and penalties for hoarding food. I thought that was kind of interesting um, that they were they were so strict there. <clears throat> the US did not have any um, food rationing during World War I. So this one was particularly in Canada, and of course they had to support uh, Great Britain a little bit more than, than we did, and for a longer period of time. Um, <clears throat> And here is just another little poster um, encouraging people to eat the fish and the vegetables uh, so they can save the other uh, items like wheat and meat and bats uh, to send over to the soldiers. Um, just focusing on what they could grow and eat themselves. Um, there's, there's just tons of these uh, really cool old vintage uh, posters that I found just rummaging through. I could have put like 50 or 60 more up here because there are so many, but I found them really interesting. And if anybody has a question, uh, I'm not seeing the chat. It's a little hard to see chats. So if anybody has a question, feel free to pop in and stop me. Or maybe Claire can read the chat and then uh, let me know if there's a question that needs to go right now or needs to be answered right away. All right, so we have fish and vegetables here, focus. And then I liked, oops, sorry, I'm frozen again. Here we go. I like this one. <laughs> Anybody love butter? I love butter. Um, apparently, so does Canada and um, Great Britain. <laughs> so uh, they just, this was just, I found this funny because it just focused on butter. And we needed to do better. And I really like the pun, Canada's fair opportunity. <clears throat> Thought it was kind of funny. All right, so World War II led to the uh, development of the Women's Land Army and the School Garden Army, which I knew about the Women's Land Army, but the School Garden Army was kind of new to me. I've heard of school gardens before, but that one was definitely new to me. Um, it was a focused campaign after the success or um, of all of the victory gardens, because they really promoted the victory gardens. Um, and a lot of people took it to heart and started planting their gardens all over the place. Um, and after that success, they, they, they noticed that they were having such good success, they decided to create the school garden army. And um, this one was actually created by the US Bureau of Education, and it was funded by the War Department with the blessing of President Wilson. And it was for boys and girls ages nine through 15. And as you can see here, this is kind of their main poster, the one with the Pied Piper, that's kind of their logo poster. And their motto, a garden for every child and every child in a garden. Uh, that kind of reminds me of one of the uh, five library <laughs> rules. I just got out of library school, so I remember that still. Um, and then over on the left side, you can see the one that just says enlist now, because you actually had to enlist in this army. So, and it was run much like a real um, army unit. Um, they provided manuals for their army. 
in other words, the children, that included um, information on how to choose your uh, your plot of land, both in uh, the country and in town. So they highly encourage people to use plots of land in town. Um, lots of empty lots and backyards were encouraged. And um, it also included growing tips for the children for uh, both the North and South regions. So they kind of knew what to plant, when to plant and how to plant. Um, they encouraged, of course, the rotating of the crops and um, what soils to use and just bunches of information for the children. Now, I wouldn't call these manuals. I looked through some of them and because they have been scanned in um, through the Michigan State University Library. And I looked through them. They're not exactly, I wouldn't call them child friendly. They don't have a lot of pictures. It's mostly words and instructions. So not something that I think a kid would be really interested in, but it did have lots of <laughs> good information. And I think it was probably more for the parents to help have more hands on, um, hands on with their kids projects and stuff. Um, they'd probably have to provide lots of guard guidance and of course, and um, encourage them to find a plot of land to work. And um, I actually have the link if anybody's interested in just browsing through those manuals. I kind of like looking at old posters and old manuals, just to kind of see how things were written. And it kind of gives you an idea of the time. The, the link is actually in the resources at the end of the PowerPoint. <clears throat> All right, so many of the articles that I was reading on the school garden army um, emphasized how it was run like a military unit. I remember reading one that described um, all these kids out and uh, a teacher would blow a whistle and they would um, stand up from what they were working on and blow the whistle again and then they would file down the rows into a nice line and then the third whistle they would put they would carefully put up their tools so they were encouraged to take really good care of their tools and most of this work was done after school so it was kind of done on their own time their own hours <clears throat> But um, a lot of the manuals also emphasize taking care of uh, their own health. So the children kind of um, had to learn how to, you know, not get injured when they're working because I uh, don't know about anybody else, but when I'm bending over trying to like weed or something, after a while your back hurts, you get muscle strains and that kind of thing. And they recognize that. So they encouraged, they told the children how to avoid that or take care of themselves. Um, if that happens. So that was also included in the manual, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, other than the children's um, school army or school garden army, um, this is also when the land, the women's land army was created. I, um, I've heard, I had heard of the women's land army because of TV shows. I don't know if anybody watches Land Girls. Um, it's a British television show. Came out quite a few years ago. They have like two seasons, if anybody's interested. Um, it's just a drama. But uh, through that show, I had heard of the Women's Land Army, but it actually started in World War I, whereas that series is actually based in World War II. Um, so again, just like the Children's Garden Army, um, they recruited women to come and uh, take over a lot of the vacant farming um, positions that were when the men left to go to war, just like they, they did it again in World War II. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the U.S. Women's Land Army was modeled after the British uh, land lassies <laughs> that uh, they had created at the same time. So we modeled our land army off of the British version. And uh, the farmers were actually called farmerettes. I thought that was interesting during that time. Instead of suffragettes, you have the farmerettes. And um, actually, some interesting um, tidbits were women were paid the same wages as the male farm laborers at the time, and their um, work days were actually uh, protected. So they had they were only required to work their eight hour days. They they couldn't be made to work more. Um, so they they were protected. Um, which was um, not, I guess, normal, uh, as normal at the time. 
and um, this had this was probably one of the first times where they all got to wear you know pants. Pants became the norm. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Um, as a result of all of the kind of combined efforts, um, mostly with the Children's Garden Army and our all the victory um, gardens that were planted. There were 3 million new garden plots planted in 1917 and 52 million were cultivated in 1918 <clears throat> and more than 5.2 million were cultivated in, sorry, 1918, I missed that, uh, which generated an estimate of 1.4 million quarts of canned fruits and vegetables because not only did they encourage <clears throat> growing, they encouraged since it was so successful, they encourage people to um, make sure that they can and save their food later for winter. <clears throat> now, after the World War One, um, the gardens kind of diminished a bit. <clears throat> but then they resurged in a world during World War too and it was very very this followed a very similar pattern we had the land armies reappear um, um, and when we entered world war ii when the u.s entered world war ii in december of 1940 food rationing actually started in the u.s in the spring of 1942 so this was the first time that the u.s actually had to uh ration yes. food and of course, the Victory Gardens and the Land Armies returned. Um, and then we see lots of examples of Victory Gardens around the US and then, of course, in Canada and Europe. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt actually planted a Victory Garden on the White House lawn. There were some people that weren't very happy about that, but she did it anyway. Um, there were, again, lots of uh, propaganda posters and there was tons of articles like this um, particular, uh, this is actually a poem um, that anchors Victory Garden Rhapsody. This was found in the Saturday Evening Post and you can find there's lots of stories encouraging uh, Victory Gardens. Um, they had tips about growing, uh, stories about people growing their own um, Victory Gardens that they would uh, publish and that came out throughout the entire time. Uh, and it really um, promoted the idea that we were helping fight the battle, helping to win the war, basically. And over here to the right, you can see the different types of foods that was encouraged to grow. So if you're interested in starting your own garden, these might be some uh, types of food that you can plant because they were promoted because they are supposedly easier to grow. Um, I cannot vouch for any of them. I <laughs> I have not tried to grow any of this yet. Um, actually, I take that back. I am attempting tomatoes, but we'll see how that goes. Um, but these are probably, these are encouraged because they were some of the easiest um, produce to, to grow. So it includes beans, beets, cabbage, carrots, kale, I don't know what that other thing is. Lettuce, peas, tomatoes, turnips, squash, and Swiss chard. Um, I've never had Swiss chard. I don't know if that's good. So maybe somebody can tell me. So um, again, the like I said, the posters were very popular. Again, they uh, they encouraged war gardens. I think even probably more than they did in World War One because of the food rationing. And um, here I have a series of pictures that just show the different war gardens during the time um, and where people uh, planted them. This one is uh, Washington, D.C. And um, it was just, I mean, really wherever they could find space is where they planted a garden. And again, most of these pictures, actually all of these pictures are from the Library of Congress. I just, you can just search by uh, War Gardens or Victory Gardens, and there are quite a few pictures. I thought they're, they're interesting if you enjoy looking at old photographs. Um, here are two more. <clears throat> this one is in New York. He's working on his Victory Garden on a Sunday morning. He looks very happy. And as you can see, this is just on the front part of his lawn. 
right in between the sidewalk and it looks like the street. Oops, right, froze again. All right, here are two more. The picture on the left is actually um, from London and the note said it was built in a bomb crater, which I was really interesting. They turned something that was um, destructive into something good. You can see there are actually two people, so it's a lot larger than it looks. You can see the two people um, in the center working on their different areas. And then the picture on the right is um, from Washington, D.C. And it looks like it's kind of in that same area as uh, the previous picture, the picture with the woman. And um, you can kind of see where it's this little strip in the back of the homes that they're using for various um, gardens. So even just small pieces of land were encouraged to be used. Um, here's another one, New York City. The this is built on the Charles Schwab estate and they had lots of um, vacant land. So they used that one. <clears throat> and here's another one from Alabama, Tennessee Valley Authority. Yep. Uh, this is uh, this is a family. Just as you can see from the, the note, it says they're discussing their victory garden. It looks like they are very successful. Their corn looks pretty good. <laughs> I know that's one. And then here is a picture uh, kind of just representing the women on the farms. Uh, they they did most of the work during World War II as well. They <clears throat> signed up to join the land army or they just took over many of the farming duties uh, uh, so that they would have enough food not only to send overseas to the um, troops, but also to feed themselves and uh, their community. And they also, and here the note actually says that she <clears throat> tries to get, uh, they, um, they gather scraps and salvage things to be recycled. That was big during World War II. And they looked like they had a really successful um, garden. <laughs> so I thought I'd show this picture to see how it can turn out. I'm, I'm not sure if my garden would ever look quite like that. So anyway, uh, all you have to do to start a garden is plant it, grow it, and pick it. Uh, it sounds easy, but um, maybe not for people like me who don't have a green thumb. <clears throat> now, since sorry, since World War II, there have been various movements towards, uh, I guess, picking up victory gardens again, or types of victory gardens. They don't always call them victory gardens. Um, they, uh, there was the slow food movement that emerged in the United States in the late 1990s and mid 2000s. Um, they kind of started focusing on um, producing or growing your own produce and farmers markets started popping back up again then, um, becoming more uh, popular. A lot of the reasons that they, <clears throat> these started becoming popular again was because of there were, um, they were trying to avoid, you know, pesticides being a little bit more organic um, and the just the overall health benefits of actually working the land. So it's very uh, relaxing to kind of do garden. It's a lot of work, but at the same time, it's it's very relaxing and you're going to get a sense of accomplishment when things actually do grow. And then you can have the bonus of actually being able to eat your own produce. Um, lately, with the COVID-19 pandemic, they have uh, Victory Gardens have kind of started to reemerge. Uh, there's quite a few articles uh, early on about uh, the amount of sales for um, garden centers um, and how they had to make sure that they could uh, they had to reorder and restock um, pretty consistently because people were really focused on trying to get outdoors and growing their own food. Probably some of it was for security, and then the other thing was projects to do. Um, but there are lots of reasons and there's tons of YouTube videos about how to start your own garden. There's tons of articles um, in lots of different types of magazines. Um, I think there was any like Southern Gardening. Um, they just have, there's just so much out there. It's kind of hard to find which one works because there's so, or 
which one would be best for you because there's so much information out there. Um, but there are also some articles that are fairly easy and there's kind of a, I guess, a movement on um, how to start your garden using scraps of food, which is what I kind of attempted to do. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of what I tried to do. So this is my version of a victory garden. And I'm just going to have to share a different screen. So excuse me for one second while I get out of here. And here we go. Sorry, one second, I'm having some technical difficulty sharing. Sorry, one moment. Sorry, still having a little bit of problem. Let's see if this works instead. All right. Claire, can you see my screen with the video on it? I see a screen. Yeah, I think it's a video. Mm -hmm. It says my garden. Yes. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is my version of a victory garden, and this is my backyard. I do not have a green thumb, but I have managed over the last few years to kind of get a little bit of one. Um, so this is just <clears throat> my backyard and where I started. My first attempt was actually um, I had some potatoes that were growing in my basket so i decided just to stick them in the ground and this one is from actually last year so before i actually started trying to grow things from my refrigerator um but i just put the potatoes in there and i was going for just a pretty plant but they actually started to grow and over here i took these are more recent i planted these this spring those are some green onions that i bought from the grocery store and after i cut off the top and used them i stuck the bottom in uh, water on my window seal and just let them reroot and then i transplanted them to this bucket and, and uh, these two are um, these two pots are a little bit older i did these last year and they survived the winter and that short little one right there in the middle is actually just a regular onion that I did the same thing to. I, I used the top of it and then I just put the bottom part uh, where there's kind of a little bit of root in water and it started to grow more. Now, unfortunately, since this recording, that one didn't make it. Um, <laughs> sometimes things happen. Um, you have to watch out, though. Um, I found that there are lots of uh, caterpillars that really like my green onions. And so I have to clean out the, the middle of it really good before I eat them. Um, that middle one is my rosemary. And actually that is from a cutting that I got. I bought one plant of rosemary and from there I made, did cuttings and I was able to uh, propagate even more. So you just kind of cut right um, below where it's not quite twiggy and you cut right there and then you rip off the bottom part, the bottom uh, leaves and put them in water and just leave a little bit up at the top and it'll grow roots and you can replant it later. This plant right here is supposed to be mint. Now I actually bought that one and it didn't quite make it. Mm -hmm. However, it did come back. As you can see from that picture right there, it did come back. And here are my pepper plants. One pepper plant right here, that one I purchased and I um, planted it. It's a jalapeno pepper plant and I've actually had two very small 
peppers on it. Uh, one this year, and then I think I had two actually the last year. So this one's been around for a little while. This one right here actually grew from seed. It's from my aunt's um, garden. She gave me some seeds and I planted it and I got a little bit of um, one growing last year. And then those littles in the back are actually seeds that I dried from this plant and planted this year. So as you can see, they grew. I was surprised. I didn't think they were gonna grow. I was very happy. Um, and they'll actually get bigger and you'll see in just a second that I'll have a picture of them growing big. So they're in the back. They grew fast and well. Now I attempted, this is a new one, tomatoes. These are tomatoes. I just took some tomatoes that looked like they were going bad. I sliced them up, I put them in the dirt and I covered them with dirt. And they actually started to grow, which I was surprised. Here are my turmeric and um, in the back is a non-edible ginger though. But my turmeric here, um, again, these started, I buy turmeric because it's supposed to be very good for you. And it started getting little um, <clears throat> shoots. So I just decided to put them in dirt. And sure enough, they started to grow. Now, there are some caterpillars that really, really like them. So they have holes in them right now. But uh, they made it. And here is my edible ginger. I did the same thing I did with the turmeric. Uh, it started to uh, root. Um, some of them dried out. You can see a little bit there in the corner. Uh, that's one that just kind of dried out. But the ones that looked like they started to get sprouts, I just put them in the ground. And I've actually had this plant for about two years now. And I was a little worried it wasn't going to come back, but you can see the small sprouts coming back now. Uh, so I was very happy it survived. <laughs> and these are pretty easy to keep to take care of. I just make sure that I watered all of these all day. I mean, every day. And this is in my um, ginger now. It grew more since I took that video. <clears throat> and here are some other plants that I have. This, uh, the big, this is a basil plant. The big one, I purchased a already grown plant and I just put it in soil. And then those little bitty ones are actually from seeds. And I planted them in early spring, um, probably right about the time we went into quarantine, maybe a week or so before. And then they started sprouting. And in a minute, you'll see how big they got. I mean, it was pretty successful. Uh, basil is easy to propagate as well. You've just cut right there above where the two, um, the two leaves are. And then if there's too much leaf at the top, you just uh, rip off a little bit and make sure you leave some leaf at the top. And then you put it in water and it will root and then you can replant it later. My cilantro didn't survive. So um, the cilantro, I don't know how to grow. I've tried year after year. If anybody has any tips for me, let me know. I cannot grow cilantro. Um, I grew it from seeds, but this is about as good as it got. <laughs> and I wasn't able to eat any of it because <laughs> it died before it got too big. I keep trying, but it, I've been unsuccessful so far. Um, right there is, this is not edible, but um, I was attempting to um, grow a vitex tree. I have uh, one I purchased and I grew and it got really big and I took some cuttings this last year and I just decided to see if I could propagate them and it did work, um, at least for some of them. This right here is my thyme that I planted from seeds. It survived the winter, but then a bug got to it and it ended up dying shortly after this video was taken. Um, but it, it smelled really good and it did really well for a while. So if I was able, if I had been able to keep the bug off of it, it would have, um, done really, really well. So here are my, this is my basil today. I just went out and took some uh, fresh pictures to show how things are going today. And this plant right here is actually, um, a lemongrass. It's supposed to help take, um, keep away mosquitoes. I don't know how well it keeps away mosquitoes. Um, there's still tons in my backyard, but it's really good. You know, they use it a lot in like Thai food. Um, I make Tom Kha soup sometimes and you use it. And it also makes really, really good tea. You take the leaves and you can dry them out or you can use them fresh. I just wash them and then I boil them. I wrap them up in a string, I boil them. And then I make sure I filter it out just in case, uh, but it makes really good tea with honey. It's one of my favorite things to drink. And as you can see, there's quite a bit. This is not my only plant. This one isn't a pot because it will grow and grow and grow. You saw the little one down below. That's what this one started off with, even smaller. And within about a year, it was this size. I have one I planted in the ground and it's even bigger because um, the roots, it's got a very large root system that just grows underneath. Now, this is my most successful plant. It's my rosemary. It's been around for the longest. 
Uh, this was my original plant that I took um, the cuttings off to create to make the other one that you saw earlier in the video. And um, this one's just doing much, much better. It really likes being in the ground. So um, my neighbor was not kind enough to help me. and She keeps encouraging me to put everything in the ground because things do better in the ground, um, or at least for the most part they do. And as long as my ground is very um, clay, I live actually off around Clay Road. Um, <laughs> and it is all clay around here. So I had to build up a little bit and add some soil. But for the most part, most of what I put in the ground is doing well. Um, again, here's just some of my um, videos. So I'm going to fast forward just a little bit. Looks like there was a repeat. Here I um, I actually planted some, excuse me, planted some regular potatoes. Uh, my other plant was sweet potatoes. These are regular potatoes. And they started to grow. They've disappeared. I'm not sure if they've made it, but then another one has started to sprout more recently. So it, I may have potatoes, I may not. I don't, I'm, I'm still working on my potato growing skills. <laughs> you can see one little plant right there. It went away for a little while, but now it's back. And then there is my sweet potato that I showed you earlier. All right, some of these are repeats. And that is the end of my garden video. Okay. Anyway, so as you can see, I, um, I attempted to grow my own victory garden and you can put all the gardening um, things that I've read. And um, I don't know if anybody attended even the wildscape um, one that we had on gardening a little while ago. And she also encouraged, well, sometimes it's just one or two things in pots on your window seal, um, just in your backyard, in your front yard, wherever you can find it, just a little bit. So, um, I mean, you can grow things just about anywhere. You just have to make sure you take care of it and water it. Um, the only thing that I've learned in the last two years is water, 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 especially in Texas. Um, for a little while, I thought I was overwatering things, and I was not. <laughs> um, so just water everything. I water all my plants twice a day in the, in the heat of summer. Yes, all of these get watered twice a day. Unless they're in complete shade, which I might water once a day. Um, I have some tea leaves that obviously aren't for eating, um, but those are the only plants that I water maybe every other day, if I remember, <laughs> um, but they are in complete shade um, and it's very moist too. So, but other than that, all of my plants get watered at least twice a day, even just a little bit, or one time than the other time. So, but I am a complete novice when it comes to growing things. Um, I I've never had a green thumb except for the last couple of years. Um, I've uh, growing up, I killed cactuses. Um, so uh, those are really hard to kill, but I'm very talented that way. I killed cactuses from lack of water, not not overwatering, which I know is possible from lack of water. That's how bad I was. Um, even though I tried to water it, I just couldn't get the timing right. Anyway, um, so if I can grow some stuff, I'm pretty sure anybody can grow some stuff. And as you saw in the um, the um, PowerPoint, there's a list of things that are supposedly easier to grow. So if you're going to start off with a garden, start off with the really easy stuff. Um, maybe even start off with herbs. I don't know. I think some herbs are fairly easy because you can you can have those on your windowsill. But anyway, that is all I have today. Um, Rachel had some really interesting information about some of our um, farmers markets. Rachel, did you want to share any of that information with us? Um, sure. It's pretty much the same as at the beginning. Look out in your city newspaper for a farmers market or on their Facebook. A lot of the farmers markets right now are just sort of starting back up since you know with covid they were down for a little bit but they're actually starting back up again and there are a lot of farmers markets and sometimes just farms that are doing community supported agriculture or csa which is where they will take you know a box of produce that's seasonal and ship it to where you live and you pay a certain amount per month to belong to that it just depends the expense wise on what you choose and who you're going with. I actually found out about this kind of stuff in high school because a friend of mine lived on a working farm. And 
my mom actually grew up with um, basically what would have been a victory garden that lived a very long time. And so she's a very big gardener and can home canner and that kind of thing. So she's always on the lookout for, you know, local produce and that since they live closer to the city, though they do have a little bit in their backyard. Unfortunately, I am the antithesis of a green thumb. <laughs> I touch a plant and it dies. Um, so That's how I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping at some point to have some success with some herbs that the cats don't end up eating my plants. But um, there are even little kits that you can buy to grow your own herbs inside now. And I've taken a look at some of those. And a couple of our other librarians here too, like Janine and Bronwyn also belong to CSA as our regulars at farmer's markets. One of the cool things about if you become a regular at a farmer's market is that the people who are trying out new products will often ask you to review or try out a new thing that they're doing, which is pretty cool. Um, also, if you live at all close to the Tomball area, there is a lady who her mother is from Italy and I think she's second generation that has a pasta factory out there and makes homemade Italian pasta, which is mm. delicious and part of the reason why I'm chubby. Um, but if you're interested in farmers markets and CSAs, I know that Bridgeland has one, Jersey Village has one. And a lot of the same people go to different farmers markets. So if you miss one, it's not a super big deal. You can drive over to the next. And sometimes you'll find co-ops and nurseries that work with farmers markets. So if you're interested in more info on that, I can ask around and see what we can find out. Great. Thank you so much. We were talking right before everything started and she was sharing some of the information. I was like, oh, that fits perfectly. Thank you, Rachel. Welcome. For those of us who can't grow, <laughs> buy, buy local. And HEB does a lot of buying from local producers, which is why they're so well stocked here. Uh, some of our other groceries do too. Great. Does anybody have any uh, questions or comments like to share their experience growing? Anybody else? Managing to grow stuff in their yard in a pot on a windowsill. Mm. Yep. Well. Mm. Uh. Oh, I see somebody was asking about Land Girls. Land Girls is on Amazon through, I think, Acorn TV. It used to be on Netflix. Oh, Land Girls. I'm, I'm reading through some of the um, comments, but yeah, there's tons. If you go, I know we're not talking about TV, but if you're interested in World War II, World War I dramas, uh, BritBox, um, <laughs> Masterpiece, and uh, Acorn TV have a lot, but you have to pay fees for that. And of course, you can always um, go through our library. We have series through the library. You can get, um, just put it on hold and pick it up at one of our um, branches that are open for curbside. Sorry, Claire. You're on mute. Foil's War. Yes. Is, is another one both of us really liked. Yes. And like you can get one. that at the library. Yeah. It's about World War Two. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good one. Well, this is great. Um, so did you want to show us how to get a hold of our, our cookbook? Yes. Okay. Uh, just real quick, let me share my screen again. Almost, I got carried away with the video and the other information. Oops, sorry, moving. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry Cindy's not with us because she was instrumental. Yeah. It was her, it's her baby, this cookbook. She came up with the idea, got contributions, made it yes. beautiful, and 
some good recipes in there. Yeah. Okay. So if you can, everybody see my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so if you go to our SciCare library homepage, you can go to events and programs. Click on adults. And then on the side here, you can find our life workshop. And then here's link, of course, for today's video. And then right below it is our cookbook. So you can, this looks like a PDF you can just download or click on here and we can open the cookbook straight up. So, and it's just in a PDF type form. So you can just open it up. Here's our table of contents that I showed earlier and appetizers and side dishes. So you can just browse through here and it says, oh, this one's from Claire's family. Um, different uh, different, uh, different foods from uh, staff members. So as you can see here, we list uh, where the picture is from, uh, who, uh, who included the, pitch, um, the recipe in the cookbook, and the instructions. So you can just browse through for different recipes. Mmm. 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 Mm. Yeah, that looks good. <laughs> Macaroni and cheese. Always mm. good. Pimento cheese. I know a few people really like that. Spinach. Well, that looks healthy. Uh, Texas best pico. Nice. Mm -hmm. Texas caviar. Ooh, even have cocktails. <laughs> Very nice soup. That one looks really good. And wind Thanks. soup is in there. My favorite. <laughs> I had never heard. How do you say that one? Wind. Gazpacho. Gazpacho. That is interesting. I love gazpacho. <laughs> soups. Actually, these soups look really good. And a lot of these recipes are from some of our past life programs. So it's kind of a trip down memory lane. Mm -hmm. Salad. Ahi mango pea. Okay. Okay. That what is, what, is that poke? Is that poke or poke? Okay. Oh, what, and what is that? Uh, raw fish. Okay. <laughs> tuna. Usually raw tuna. Sounds good. Yeah, it is good. Um, some people don't like the texture, but it is good. <laughs> I like it with soy sauce, but. It's poke. Poke, it's... yeah. Okay, I thought it was poke. <laughs> poke is, some people call it pokey, but pokey, it's, I poke. think it's the pr pronounce, correct pronunciation of poke, or at least that's how they say it in Hawaii. And if you say it wrong over there, they get you. They oh, teach you. Oh. <laughs> They'll tease you. I got teased. <laughs> maybe you should say your it. dog poke. <laughs> I, maybe I should. Oh, <laughs> uh, pasta well, salad. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Leah. You're this welcome. is so interesting. I think it's so. I think it's so interesting to go back in history and how things repeat themselves, and mm -hmm. because we're going through this, you know, and we're not the only ones, and we we have a lot of things to be grateful for, and. and um, Thank you for letting us learn about the past and all that kind of thing. And, um, and I love those posters too. It really brings home what they did. You know, just mm -hmm. primary sources, the librarians have to do their primary sources. <laughs> so um, next week we are going to have Tracy Williams, one of our librarians, and I call her her an explorer and adventurer. And she's going to give us some of her experience with Texas I'm going, State Parks. I'm going to the restaurant. All say right. that again. Um, you could just save this for dinner. It was for dinner. Um, of the food I'm going to pick up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're just having a little um, <laughs> side conversation there. So um, ne next week, same time, same station. And um, thank you very much, Leah and and Cindy in absentia. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Rachel, for your editing. And Rachel is going to be our new life cop chair of programming starting September. So I'm so excited to see what she's going to come up with because I'm retiring, as you all know, um, at the end of the month. And um, yay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. I guess we can stop recording if you have it already.
And if there are no more questions, I'll say 